Uh, let me welcome everybody. Welcome to the Future Trends Forum. My name is Brian Alexander. I'm the forum's creator, host, and chief cat herder, and I'm delighted to see you all here today. I'm absolutely delighted to have an unusual session today. We have a panel of four folks. Uh, each of them has a position at an institution, a college or university, and each of them over the past few years has led some interesting innovation. And we wanted to bring them all together so that they could share their lessons learned. How do you actually implement an innovation in the real world of higher education as we know it? Now, there's four of them, uh, and we just quickly uh, introduce them by their titles and their institutional affiliations. I'm going to bring them up one at a time so they can tell their stories, and then you can bombard them with your questions and your thoughts. Uh, we've got Kate Miffitt, who is Assistant Director of Innovation at California State University's Office of the Chancellor. That's a system-wide position. We have Matt Raskoff, who is now Associate Vice President for Digital Education and Innovation at Duke University. We have Michael Zward, who is Associate Director of Learning and Innovation at Dartmouth College, although apparently he's hiding out in the middle of Vermont today. And Ari Badr Natal, who is the Chief Technology Officer for Cal Calbright College, which is the newly launched wholly online California Community College. So I'm going to bring this slide down and start bringing these folks up one by one so we can learn from them. I'm going to begin with. Kate Miffin. Hello, Kate. Hi, can you hear me okay? Perfectly. Great, nice to see you all today. Well, thank you so much for coming. I'm really glad you came. And I have to say, I admire your background. That's really thank you. <laughs> Kate, there's so many ways that we can introduce ourselves in higher education. There's so many topics. And the way that we usually do here in the forum is we ask you, what are you gonna be working on for the next year? What's uppermost in your mind? What are the big projects and themes for you personally for the rest of 2021? Sure. So um, I uh, have a pretty diverse portfolio, but there was one effort I wanted to talk about today um, because while the effort itself isn't um, necessarily innovative, I think it points to an innovation challenge that many of us will share moving forward. So um, my role is situated in central IT. Mm -hmm. And when the pandemic hit, um, one of the prim priorities for all of our IT units across the system, we're comprised of 23 campuses, um, was to ensure um, student uh, device and internet access. And so our IT units mobilized very quickly. We distributed something like, I think, over 22,000 devices, over 10,000 mobile hotspots. Wait, wait, and did you say 22,000 devices? Yes. Yeah, across the system. So our system serves 480,000 students um, to give some context. Um, so it was a really tremendous effort and all of the campuses worked really hard to, to support student learning. Um, so we partnered with um, Educause in the fall to um, conduct a study on student access um, to devices and internet. And so we uh, piloted the quantitative phase in the fall and we're beginning the qualitative phase in the spring. So I think the provocation I want to share or my hypothesis that's going to come out of this is that I think we're going to enter a phase where um, the demand and adoption of digital learning is going to be at the highest that it's been um, among uh, learners and among faculty, while at the same time we're just beginning to really understand the inequities in, um, in access and in digital fluencies. And so um, I think it's the, the counterintuitive cha innovation challenge in there is um, I think we're going to have to explore pedagogical approaches that are low bandwidth, that are mobile friendly, that are based on universal design, which while not new, um, I think uh, cut against the perception that we often have that innovation is like the new shiny technology and the most exciting stuff, right. which right. Um, while I think offer a lot of new possibilities, don't they often also pose accessibility and equity challenges. So. Right. Um, but that's one of the things that we're we're going to uh, explore further um, as we move into the spring semester. Oh, well, fantastic. Fantastic. That's an enormous amount of work. I'm impressed by the scale. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Kate. I'm going to bring up some of your colleagues right now. Um, so um, hang on for one second. I'd like to add to our mix, uh, Ari uh, Bader Natal. And let's see. First of all, let's bring Ari up. Hello, Ari. Hello. How are you? Happy to be here today. Well, I'm glad you could be here. Uh, did I massacre your name too badly? No, Ari Bitternatel. Thank Bitter you. Natal. Nice of you to be here. And I appreciate you having a, a great background that's completely appropriate. California. There we go. 
Exactly. Well, where are you today? I should ask. Uh, so I am in California, uh, in uh, Davis. So it's uh, sunshine here, uh, but uh, very good. Um, yeah. So uh, let's see. What can I share? Similarly, on uh, what we're working on this year. Um, yes. What you in particular? What's uh, most for your uh, your uh, your efforts in your mind? Yeah, so um, so I'm I uh, I work at Calbright College. Calbright is a new uh, a newly launched college in the community college California community college system, and um, and so a lot of what we're doing uh, built on a very different model than other colleges in the system, and so a lot of what um, you know our team spends time building, and I myself will be uh, continuing to spend a lot of time doing, is uh, the various parts of um, on the one hand institution building. And on the other hand, um, trying to find um, uh, sort of our own unique model. And um, so that plays out in a couple different ways. Um, one that's particularly interesting right now is Calbright's built on a competency-based uh, education model. And, um, oh. and there are um, uh, some pieces of that which are, uh, you know, uh, interesting and different challenges uh, to sort of figure out. Uh, one that we've been looking at closely has been ways of modeling, visualizing, um, and uh, measuring pace and progress, um, which is uh, an interesting challenge in a flexibly paced program. Another, uh, we're doing work right now on preparing for accreditation. Um, and uh, that, that process generally is um, uh, designed for degree granting institutions and, and Calbright uh, has been building programs around certificate programs. So um, how we do that looks a bit different, um, and uh, and then uh, and then really just building out the right team, um, and so uh, uh, you know in order to be successful, you need to have uh, the right the right folks with the right um, you know uh, experience in place in order to uh, make this uh, come to be. So Indeed. that's uh, that's the year. Well, that's quite a year ahead. Uh, I've got to ask a couple of quick questions about Calbright. Ari, uh, first. Uh, you mentioned giving certificates. Are you also going to be granting associate's degrees? Uh, so right now we're focused uh, entirely on certificates that are aligned with um, industry uh, credentials or programs that are aligned with industry credentials. Um, and uh, but in terms of what the um, you know, so that's that's where we're focused right now. Very good. And the second quick question is, uh, is this the first academic year of operation for Calbright? Uh, so we opened our doors in October of 2019. And so uh, we're a little bit over a year now, but uh, we don't work on a traditional no. academic calendar. Um, so every um, st you know, uh, student term start every week. Uh, so we don't, we don't quite have the same notion of uh, you know, wrapping up at the end of a semester, but um, yeah, just about a little bit over a year in operation. Oh, fantastic, fantastic. Uh, well, thank you. Thank you so much for uh, for coming. And uh, I'm really looking forward to hearing uh, more from you. Let me bring up a couple of your other colleagues right now. Um, and um, let's see uh, who else we can fit on, uh, on our stage. If we can reach out to the middle of Vermont, let's bring up Mike Goodsward, uh, who comes to us from Dartmouth College. Michael, hello. Hi, Brian. And uh, hello to the panel and all your guests today. It's good to be with you. Oh, it's great to see you. Great to see you. Um, tell us, so uh, you get the pattern of the questions. What are, what are you going to be working on at Dartmouth for the next year? Yeah, I, and uh, thank you for that framing just sort of about this present moment that we're all living through. And it certainly provides uh, context and uh, for our work. Um, so I want to just mention um, one thing about Dartmouth College is that we're on a quarter-based uh, academic term system. Um, so in the past year, as people in March uh, at semester-based schools were kind of looking forward, looking towards teaching out a semester, we were preparing for our spring semester completely remotely. And so we've had now three terms to sort of explore and iterate. Um, and I think in our further on in the conversation, we'll sort of talk about those different levels of innovation and how we define that. Um, and certainly that's been um, fluid and evolving this coming year. Um, so one of the primary things that I'm looking forward to is harvesting the lessons that we've learned through this 
grand remote experiment. Um, that's happening in various ways, in, in informally and formally. Um, one of the ways is uh, we're working with some sociology students in a capstone course this term who are looking at the survey data of students and faculty about their experiences through this remote learning uh, time and really hoping to learn more about what's working and, and areas where we've increased access and, and accessibility. Um, I'll also be working with a team to explore our new multi-platform uh, ecosystem of digital learning in partnerships with edX and Coursera Emeritus. Um, and, uh, you know, another area that I'm excited to be partnering with faculty on is something that happened right as the pandemic was starting, and that is turning the lens of information literacy to the information that was being put out about the um, about the pandemic, about the virus, and about the vaccine. Um, so I think that uh, this is sort of near to my heart. I have a background in teaching um, information literacy at a previous institution in the New Hampshire public system. And um, I think many of your uh, audience will agree this is a moment that we all need more information literacy uh, in our society. Um, so that's that's quite a bit. Um, I'll, I'll leave it there for now. Well, thank you, thank you. Um, that's quite a year ahead of you. Um, and uh, uh, each of you seems to have a, a, a different angle. Um, now I'd like to bring up the fourth member of our panel. Uh, and this time um, I'm actually gonna need Ari, forgive me for a minute. I'm going to need to clear some room, so I'm going to knock you off just for a second. I'll bring you back in a bit. Um, but I want to uh, invite uh, uh, who I think is the presiding genius of this event, um, uh, Matthew Raskoff, coming to us from Duke. Uh, and um, let's see if we're on. Hello. Hello, Brian, and thank you so much for having me here today. It's great to be with you and 119 participants in the Future Trends Forum. Pretty amazing. Well, I'm so glad that you could be here. And uh, the forum community is terrific. And you're obviously a major draw, all of you. Uh, so this is a huge question to ask you, Matthew. Um, at Duke, uh, what does the rest of 2021 look like for you? What are you going to be spending most of your time and energy working on? And thank you, Brian. And I, I love this framing because it's so concrete and it allows us to bring these big ideas down to the level of Earth and projects and our plans. And I think that's very helpful to make this work more tangible. Um, one very simple observation I would start with is that many more of our colleagues in our institutions and outside them recognize the value of what we do in our offices for digital learning, instructional design, faculty development. At Duke, we call it learning innovation, and we bring together those different disciplines. But like, I think people now understand what we do, and they value it so much more highly than they ever did in the past. And that creates new opportunities for us. That I think, you know, build on what Mike was saying about harvesting the lessons of what worked and what did not and turning them into new programs that allow our colleagues, our faculty colleagues in particular, to synthesize and crystallize those lessons and turn them into new designs and new programs and new courses. So to me, I think that harvesting needs to happen now because as soon as the pandemic ends, we're gonna be looking to the future. Nobody is necessarily gonna to wanna to look back to a very painful year we need to put in place the data collection infrastructure, the IRB approvals and the consents mm -hmm. to do longitudinal studies and track the impact on students you know, beyond this year into the future. And at Duke, what I would say is our focus is on helping faculty carry the innovation forward. That's what we're calling it. And we're launching a program with that title next week that combines technical assistance and small grants for faculty in four areas in research on innovative learning, explorations of new learning technologies, re envisioning a course or a program for flexible or online learning, and in building faculty learning communities. And we want to help them you know, turn that experience, whether it was a good experience or a bad experience, because failures can also lead to reforms and new ideas for what people want to change. But we want to be with them in that process and support them through this combination of technical consulting from our team and small grants that allow them to procure some new technology or get the tools in, to the hands of students that they might need in order to carry the innovation forward. So that's that's our message for this year that I hope is relevant to your audience as well. 
Well, that's a that's very very relevant, and I love the way all four of you now have all these points of overlap but yet difference. Um, how uh, Matthew, you're talking about provisioning uh, hardware to some degree, uh, which is uh, um, which connects with Kate's far more ambitious um, and grand uh, hardware provisioning work, uh, and thinking about uh, all four of you uh, in terms of research into what just happened over the past year. Um, now, each of you has a story to tell uh, about innovation, and I, I'd like if, if each of you could tell your story uh, for the audience. But before we do that, before we do that, uh, you've already elicited questions. Um, this is the kind of, the forum is always, always eager to pounce. Uh, and so I'll bring these quick, up, and I beam them, I think, at a couple of specific audiences. Two of them, Kate, are actually for you. Uh, so the uh, comes to you from um, Michael Johnson, a great guest from Benetech, and uh, he asks, uh, "What was the breakdown by operating system of the devices that were distributed?" Uh, they were, I think, almost entirely Chromebooks or tablets. So um, I think um, I don't think we had any um, Apple products in the ecosystem that were distributed, mostly Chromebooks. So, and the tablets were all Chrome OS or, I imagine, uh, or Android I, I, OS. Too. Yes, I think so. Fascinating, fascinating. Great question, Michael. Uh, and and thank you, Kate. Uh, there's a, another quite another question, Kate, about your uh, opening comments coming to us from the awesome, awesome at large former uh, member of Educause and a great guest in our program, Malcolm Brown, who asks if you could say more about the subject of the study with Educause. What in particular will you be studying? Um, so I pasted a link in the chat that actually links directly to the survey questions themselves, but we are looking at both. Um, so the the kind of access, what type of internet access did a, may, might a student have access to, and then the reliability of it. So there were questions like, are you able, able to successfully complete the tasks you have to do for a class with the access that you have? And then a similar set of questions around devices. Um, and then when we move into the qualitative phase, we're going to unpack some of the interesting findings. So like one of the things that stands out is that there was a question of, you know, who do you go to for support when something, when you're having trouble with something? And um, the highest response was, um, you know, I just try to figure it out myself. And so we really want to uncover, you know, the, I guess I'll characterize it as reluctance to go to, you know, support units on campus because of course we want you know to be able to provide that support for students so um you know as we move into the next phase i think we'll dig deeper into some of the findings from the first round well thank you that sounds important especially that uh, everyone tending to uh, try and solve their own problem that's a very useful finding um thank you thank you and thank you malcolm for the question malcolm has another question uh he's clearly on, on fire today and this is aimed at uh, at you mike um, and he wants to know, could you say more about the multi-platform environment that Dartmouth is implementing? Uh, sure, thanks Malcolm and, and good to see you. Um, so uh, Dartmouth has been a partner of edX for a few years now. And um, we are like some of the institutions represented here on the forum, sort of entering this space where we have partnerships with multiple platforms. So we're kind of thinking about our institution, you know, our liberal education value that we hold dearly, um, and, and also the, uh, the parts of the institution that are focused on professional education and how those all fit with these different partners. Um, so it's a, it's a lot of, um, I think, internal uh, reflection and also external view that we're trying to bring together over the next year. Well, thank you. Um, good question, um, but uh, don't mute yourself yet, Mike, because there's another question for you, and this is coming from the library world. Um, Scott Vine at Franklin Marshall College, where he's the director of their library, uh, has an information literacy question. What will the application of information literacy principles to understanding our current social public health challenges, what will that look like at Dartmouth? Well, um, so I could talk about one particular project. One interesting thing that has emerged uh, through this remote learning is that uh, I think we have decoupled, at least for the moment, a bit from the classroom and from the term. So courses yeah. end beginning and ending. Um, so we have a, a government professor, Mia Costa, who approached us and said, 
my students this fall studied um, political attitudes around the uh, election. And the students are so engaged in this research project, they want to continue, even though the course is over, they will receive no more credit, uh, but to look at the Georgia runoff uh, Senate elections. And mm -hmm. so we were able to sort of carry forward and sort of, um, you know, I think this research will then feed back into future courses, uh, both by Professor Mia Costa, but also her colleagues and across the social sciences. Um, we're also sort of looking at, um, you know, a logarithmic bias and how that could be uh, a part of our curriculum. Um, and so I, I think we're, you know, really trying to connect the um, curriculum that's often within disciplines between disciplines uh, with this critical lens. Well, thank you. Uh, it was a deep question and, uh, and it revealed quite a bit, Michael. Thank you. Thank you. We have uh, one more question from um, uh, for you, Kate. Um, and this is from Matt Alex, who's the founder of the really interesting uh, Beyond Academics uh, enterprise. Uh, and Matt asks, how did your system create a frictionless user experience uh, to foster better remote learning models and also to support many while they were off campus with these devices that you distributed? Um, so I'll answer that in two different ways. Um, so uh, as a decentralized kind of organization, um, sometimes academic te technology is situated in IT and some of our campuses it's not. Um, we uh, definitely, um, the CSU was I think um, one of the first institutions to make the decision to stay online. We made that decision in the spring. And so that enabled our academic technology folks and our um, colleagues in faculty development to really spend a, a tremendous amount of time over the summer. Um, and I, I don't have them off the top of my head, but the numbers of um, faculty who were trained, who completed a course in developing an online course um, are really tremendous. And so that I think helped on the user experience front where we were really able to um, deliver a lot of training and development. Um, on the, now I'm forgetting the device question. Um, I'll bring it back up. Oh, <laughs> so the, 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 in terms of distributing uh, the devices, yeah, I, I mean, IT teams created, um, you know, drive through um, kind of options. Many campuses partnered with their libraries for inventory and tracking for the, um, the hardware itself. Okay. Um, but, you know, campuses were just really creative and they worked really tirelessly to, to get, um, to support students to uh, continue their learning. They created, um, you know, uh, parking lots with Wi-Fi access so students could just drive up and complete their complete work on campus without having to be exposed and going to buildings and so on. Well, just um, I have to say thank you for that uh, for that detailed answer. And Matt, thank you for the really keen question. Um, the California State University system was one of the first to proclaim they'd be online uh, in the spring and to proclaim they were online the fall 2020. And also, I think you're the one of the first to proclaim that you're looking forward to probably face to face uh, face to face this fall as well. You guys are bellwethers. Very, very important. Um, now we have uh, uh, some more questions, but they all turn precisely on the topic of innovation. So I'd like to just just quickly ask each of you if you could just share your thought about what the heck innovation is. And I, I want to pick on Mike Goodsward first um, because he uh, he shared an interesting visualization on Twitter that already got some commentary from a previous forum guest. Uh, Somebody just quick, what is innovation for you? Yeah, thank, thanks for that uh, that introduction. And I was um, wanted to share a graphic, and I think the chat only allows for text, so it's uh, it's on Twitter and and uh, tagged with the hashtag. Um, but uh, in thinking about innovation in my own career and also in the communities in which I work, it's never a solo endeavor. Mm -hmm. um, so I like to think about it, how it happens at different levels. And uh, so talking about the, I, I think of like four big spheres, um, I, G, D, and W. And I is individual. So things that are new to the individual that they're trying to adopt. Um, I think uh, at the, the parts of my career where I've been working as a learning designer, collaborating with individual faculty, there were some pretty big innovations that we were working on. They might not have been brand new to the world, but they were just as important as impactful. Um, so I think it's important for us who have uh, 
the word innovation in our title or work in centers that have innovation, that innovation is happening all over at different levels. So the, the G is something that's new to a group. So this could be a, a group of faculty, a group of students who are adopting something new into their learning experience. Um, and D um, I, is sort of self-referential to my particular institution of Dartmouth. Um, but you know, we might say, well, bringing in a multi-platform uh, strategy for online learning is brand new to Dartmouth, but it's not brand new to the world. Others have done that before. Um, and then W is is the world. And depending on where you work uh, and you know the size of your team, you might be doing more uh, in the W column. Um, but I think all four of those spheres are, are important for learners and for educators and innovators. Well, thank you uh, for sharing that. I, uh, I, and thank you for sharing that on Twitter. I just put a link to it in the chat. And uh, also, uh, uh, Roland Moe says, um, he was doing a lot of work on innovation, says, uh, this remind it's a good way of thinking about innovation as communal. So we go back to the, uh, the G there. Uh, it's similar to George Koros's education innovation definition recognizing the product and process while deliberately noting the sphere of influence, which is a, a good thing. So Mike, let me, now that you've said that, my reward to you is to knock you off stage for a minute um, and, uh, and bring up your colleague, uh, Ari, because I'd, like uh, I'd like to hear what uh, Ari's take on innovation is um, as well. So let's bring him up. So Ari, what, is, uh, what does innovation mean for you? Uh, well, I, I could uh, answer that a few different ways. I think, you know, one is uh, just in terms of how uh, how we solve, um, you know, how we're solving key problems um, that, uh, that ultimately uh, techniques that allow us to get at, um, you know, new solutions that let us sort of far outperform how we've uh, um, uh, prior prior solutions. Uh, in terms of impact, access, accessibility, a couple of different, what, you know, um, I guess the metric itself is, uh, uh, could vary in, in case to case, but I, I liked, I liked the, um, that the framework of looking at it in terms of in what spheres um, it's, uh, you see that influence. Um, and, uh, and I think, um, you know, uh, what, uh, what I'm seeing, what I think is particularly interesting um, and a little bit, uh, I think, unusual about um, the context that I'm working in is a lot of the innovation, uh, you know, of uh, that our team at Calbright is doing is actually uh, baked into the legislation that brought the college, you know, into being. And um, that's a, um, you know, so a lot of what we're doing is, um, you know, operationalizing that. And I think, you know, in some sense, um, you know, the innovation is in in the designs, but it's also in um, you know, and how we go about finding implementations of that that work. Um, so that's uh, that's uh, you know sort of what we what I see sort of on the day to day. Oh, that's fascinating because I mean, in part, your whole institution is an innovation because it's brand new. I mean, or a year and a half old, really, a mm -hmm. little less than a year and a half old. Uh, mm -hmm. But also, it it kind of it blurs the uh, the uh, world and Dartmouth, you know, world and institution. Uh, distinction because the state played such a key role in, in in shaping this. Yes, and I guess I would the last thing I would say is just for for context. This is um, uh, you know created as um, the 115th college in the California Community College System, um, and so it it operates within a context of of other institutions, but you know uh, was uh, on on built on a very different model. Yes, yeah, from the previous governor Jerry Brown. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, well, let's let's take this definitional question back. I think we're fleshing this out pretty nicely. Uh, Kate, everyone wants to ask you questions. I'd like to join the line now. Um, what does uh, innovation mean for you? Is it is it the same as what the Ari and, and uh, uh, Mike have been saying, or do you have a different spin? I don't think a dramatically uh, different one. I really appreciate the idea of thinking about innovation in communities and in spheres. And you mentioned Roland Mo. I really liked his article from a couple of years ago on a definition, working towards a definition of academic innovation, where it was really important it, that it be driven from, you know, educational theory and practice. Um, I think one point I like to emphasize in innovation is uh, thinking of it as a novel solution or improvement. And I think the idea that innovation can be iterative, 
It can be evolutionary. It doesn't have to be the revolutionary, disruptive new thing, but that it can be an improvement to, you know, a product, a process, um, mm -hmm. an experience. I think we're all uh, finding how experiences can be innovative as we're doing virtual conferences and we're learning online. I mean, there was online learning before, but I mean, as, at the scale that we're doing it now. So um, uh, the, I think the iterative component is a key part of the definition for me. Have to add that iteration. Thank you. Thank you. It's very, very important. Um, in the in the chat, um, uh, Malcolm Brown um, adds uh, recommendations for thinking about Stephen Johnson's work. Uh, he mentions the um, where good ideas come from. Uh, it focuses on the embedding of innovation in a social context, as well as his earlier book, uh, Emergence. And I, I second that. Uh, Matthew, uh, you're um, um, in many ways kind of the the uh, shepherd of this flock. Um, how does uh, um, your sense of innovation match on to your uh, three colleagues. Uh, do you have a different one that's uh, Duke specific or? Um... Thank you. I enjoyed all those definitions and I, d I agree with all of them. And I, so I guess what I would add is that I think the frontier as in learning innovation is in connecting our work to the broader missions of our institutions. And hmm. I think for too long, what we've done has been seen as peripheral, as marginal, as something nice on the side but not really at the heart of what we do. Maybe Ari's institution aside, because it is a fully online place where you know the technology is at the center. But I think for many of us, the, the challenge is in really helping our colleagues understand what those connections are and in us to make those explicit, to say that the reason we're doing this project is so we can further this mission that we share this mission of equity, this mission of access, this mission of making a more inclusive learning experience mm. in language that is not, that doesn't include some hardware solution or some software solution, which does not resonate with most faculty and most provosts and presidents and trustees. So to me, that maybe this is the, the frontier of the social layer that we're talking about. It's in drawing one wider concentric circle around our work to say, this is not fundamentally about one technology or another. It's fundamentally about strengthening our institutions, reinforcing what they do and helping them fulfill our missions for the future. And that's why we're doing this. Those are the stakes at which we're working. So it's not, you know, experimentation for its own sake is one thing that can happen in the lab. To me, innovation is intentional experimentation for the purposes of improving your institution, improving its ability to fulfill its mission and its goals. Oh, well, thank you. The uh, social context seems to be a major theme coming up today uh, and the importance of people, um, albeit in different ways. Uh, on Twitter, we just had a, uh, a quick shout out um, from, uh, um, let's see, Dr. Uh, Patricia Prosco, who says that we use the, uh, that uh, for, IGDW framework uh, when she was at Cornell for an initial round of innovation grants. Um, so this is, uh, this is a powerful thing. Um, now, just to remind you, uh, the forum is here for your questions uh, and your thoughts. So again, if you've just joined us, um, at the very bottom of the screen, if you want to type in a question, click that little question mark button. And we have a few of those that are going to pop up. And if you'd like to join us on stage with video, just click the raised hand button and I'll beam you up. It's really easy to do. Uh, some of these questions now concern innovation per se. So I want to bring up one from Eric Mystery. Hello, Eric, who asks a very practical question. How do you sell the investing in innovation when so many resources at schools are limited or overwhelmed? Great question. That's for anybody who wants to take a, a, a wing at that. So I, I could take a stab at that. Um, so my, um, the unit that I'm in was created, uh, I think about two and a half years ago, um, in part because it, it was driven by the CIOs that all the campuses saying, you know, we know innovation is really important, but we don't, you know, have time to kind of carve away, you know, from our regular day to day operations to dedicate to it exclusively. And so I see part of my role as kind of being some of the connective tissue or the innovation is happening on the campuses, but it often happens in silos. So I think the return on investment in our context is the amplification of the learnings that are happening on the ground. So by kind of centralizing innovation in the chancellor's office, we're able to build upon the experiments that campus is already doing and build on the learnings and the outcomes so that 
every campus is not starting from scratch, but they're all building on what the other campuses are doing. And again, in a decentralized um, environment, that can be really powerful. Um, and one of the ways we help to see that is we, um, I, I administer um, several uh, microfunding programs. Some are, are monetary, some are with, um, uh, you know, club credits and things like that. But um, those kind of planting a lot of small seeds and see what blossoms and then what can be um, built upon across the system, I think is where we're able to sell um, that investment. Uh, the opposite of selling in a sense you're you're you're, you're giving them uh, literally <laughs> yeah well, that's a good answer kate thank you uh matt or uh, ari did you want to add to that but one thing i would add um as we're thinking about a new grants program is that i we we really believe in the combination of technical assistance and small amounts of money i think many innovators on the faculty actually feel very isolated and very alone and if we can bring them into our communities and give them a good thought partner and interlocutor and support them with, you know, financially, but also more intellectually and to kind of create, like include them in this conversation that we're part of, that actually is incredibly validating for those faculty. They're out there and they, they need this support. It's not necessarily the majority, but if we can help them be successful, help them get a publication out of it, help them kind of be successful on their own terms, I think we'll get more of them coming, you know, following on from that. So it's maybe kind of a you know, focus on the, the innovators among your faculty who are there, who are looking for a partner and a thought partner, figure out how to help them and then build on that for the future. That, that may be one strategy. I don't think selling is the right analogy. I think it's really more of a collaborative thing. If you really have to sell that hard, you probably don't have the right product in this case. And, you should be thinking about like what is really needed among your faculty, not uh, what can you push upon them, you know? Ah, uh, oh, good answers. Uh, thank you, Matt. There, there are more questions coming in. Um, uh, Ari, did you wanna jump on that quickly? Uh, yeah, I guess I was gonna, um, so uh, when we started, I mentioned something about one of the um, projects that we're looking at is uh, ways to uh, measure pace and progress. Um, mm -hmm. And I mentioned it in the context of individual students, but really there's a version of that, an institutional version of that, that I think does connect to this question. Uh, because I think often um, when you're, uh, um, in terms of justifying um, investments in something new, um, there's uh, uh, often, um, you know, it takes some time to get up to speed. And it's that's a particularly challenging um, you know, time during which, um, you know, to make the case for that investment. And, um, but, uh, you know, when I think of pace and progress, one piece of that is what have you accomplished so far? And another is at what rate or pace are, are you, um, you know, are you moving forward? And so to some extent, um, you know, I think that that's a particularly relevant, um, you know, thing to look at, which is, um, you know, at what rate are you moving forward and I, uh, or moving towards your goal. And so I could imagine uh, in other contexts, when you're looking at uh, the value of an investment in, in innovation, you can, um, one, one metric to be looking at is, um, you know, at what rate, um, you know, uh, you know, as best you can model it, is this moving you towards whatever the goals are that are the reasons that are motivating, motivating that, that work. That pace is important, and being able to measure that is crucial. Thank you, Ari. Uh, I'd love to see how uh, what, what you, more you learn from that. Uh, we have another question here coming from Todd Russell, who's the director of Power Notes. He asks a very precise and particular question here. Uh, with so much as tech Zoom fatigue in 2021 across education, how does true innovation gain meaningful attention? And I'll give you three a, a first crack at this, but also I want to make sure I can bring up uh, Mike uh, to add uh, more of his as well. So how do you how do you do this when we have so much technology and in particular Zoom fatigue? Well, one observation that I have is that faculty are now aware of the affordances of these technologies like Zoom and their limitations. And we can channel their frustration, including with Zoom fatigue, but also the limitations of breakout groups to do active learning, whatever it is, into new designs, new features, new requirements. I think we've done a mass experiment in faculty taste development and judgment development, more than <laughs> even in dig digital learning. I think faculty now have views on these 
technologies that previously they were just indifferent about. And I think we can turn those views into new products, new designs, new requirements from our vendors, um, new startups are emerging, you know, that are solving some of these problems of Zoom fatigue, new more asynchronous models that maybe don't depend as much on the bandwidth and the connectivity and the resource constraints of synchronous learning. So uh, all of that frustration, I feel like we need to crystallize it and bottle it and make sure we don't lose it because it's going to be a fertile ground for new ideas for the future. So again, the importance of tracking this and researching this now, harvesting this now before, before it goes on. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Kate, did you want to grab that or grab that or should I, uh, should I bring up Mike? Um, I think one, one thing I'll add too is um, I think we're learning the value of the analog. And so because we're all kind of burnt out and suffering from some fatigue, I think people are having to be really deliberate in developing practices to manage that. And so I've never talked so much to colleagues about going for a walk or things that, you know, um, you have to just build more deliberately in your day. And so I think it's some of those offline practices like going for a walk, writing in a notebook um, yeah. that are also going to be kind of um, kind of the, the home for innovation to kind of bubble up and bring back into the, the technological space. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, let me uh, uh, let me uh, give um, uh, our neglected friend um, uh, his chance to uh, uh, to come up and uh, see if he wants to add more to it. And then we have another question coming in. Actually, a whole pile of questions. Um, Mike, did you want to take a run at that one? The question of tech fatigue and Zoom fatigue. Sure. So I, I think I think in the you know right out of the gate when we were starting with remote learning. Um, uh, I, I noticed socially that everyone was willing to do a Zoom dinner and then it tapered off. Uh, you know, people were just sort of like, I can't spend more time online. And I think a similar thing happened uh, in classrooms and faculty were experimenting with the multiple ways in which they could have presence with their students and their students could have presence with each other. And it wasn't the same for everyone. Um, so I think that's that's an important lesson about how, how we structure these um, there, there were also some like technical improvements to how Zoom was um, was being deployed. So in our engineering school, uh, when people are in person, there's a maker lab. People mm -hmm. couldn't be in the maker lab. So they made a digital representation and sort of tied a Zoom meeting to every lab table with the API. And then you could see who was there before coming in. So you're not sort of like dropping in blind to a, a Zoom meeting and um, you could sort of collaborate socially and informally in those ways. Um, I also did some work with our music department and you know they sort of bravely tried to perform live music together on Zoom and it was just a painful experience. You know the tool is made for one presenter at a time. There are some tweaks but they you know they, they quickly rediscovered some things that people have been making music at distance for decades, which is recording a track and sending it to each other. So they're sort of like bringing back these asynchronous, deep uh, experiences uh, to, to allow for our various presences and collaboration. Thank you, thank you. Uh, that does sound painful, but I'm glad. But it also sounds like, you know, you're, you're all kind of refer flipping that question on his head that we have technology and zoom fatigue but we're turning that around to innovate on the use of the technology and even in the zoom but before i, I don't want to seize the uh the floor i want to make sure people get more questions in. and we had one from uh, gary uh mile at yellow dig um who asked a really interesting question uh how does innovation play into helping empower peer-to-peer -peer learning amongst your students so this is a pedagogy focused question. See, this is the moment in the panel when they're like, no, you answer it, no, you answer, no, you, no, you answer it. And yeah, that, that was good. Okay, we just, Mike just bailed. Um, Thank you. So I have a, a non-classroom example. Um, we have, um, you know, a number of our mini grants um, often go to projects where the primary budget need is for student assistance. And so we have um, really rich examples of how our innovation efforts are really helping to enable student learners. And especially in, you know, the, the CSU is one of the most diverse systems in the country. 
Um, so now we're we're bringing students into um, cloud computing, robotics, AR, VR, and we're helping to bring um, diverse students to those areas. So, um, and a lot of us, I'll put a link to one of our digital transformation hubs that has a mix of over 20 student assistants, interns, um, volunteers, and they are from across disciplines and they work together on projects. And so I think that's a really rich learning environment that's peer to peer, but also mentored by IT professionals. Um, where innovation is taking place. Well, that's a great answer. Um, uh, I want to uh, uh, make sure that uh, um, we don't lose sight of that because we have, uh, I, I want to give Ari a chance to, to follow up on that, but we also have a, uh, a follow-up question for another person, which is uh, actually pretty close to that. Um, thank you, Kate. Um, Ari, did you want to uh, take a whack at this one or uh, should we move on? I think it's a great question. I mean, um, peer to peer learning, um, you know, can be very powerful. Um, you know, so far, uh, we've been building our, our program, uh, you know, asynchronously. Um, so, you know, on the upside, there isn't really, we haven't really seen zoom fatigue. I think that's more on the on the um, staff and faculty, uh, not on the student side. Uh, cool. But um, what I would point to um, is, um, you know, there is I think some very um, you know interesting peer-to-peer uh, -peer learning. That's uh, so prior prior to Calbright, I was working at, at Minerva uh, uh, Minerva Project, building Minerva schools, and I think there are some very interesting examples of uh, uh, innovative models of peer-to-peer -peer learning in in uh, in that program. Yeah, Minerva is fascinating. That's a key part of your background. If if you haven't had a chance to click through the bios of each of our uh, panelists, each one of them has a fantastic career. Um, let me, uh, if I could bring up one more question because we're, we're running low on time. We've got five minutes left. Uh, and Peter Wallace had a question which really follows up on that nicely. Uh, he's at UW Continuum College and asks, where do you see opportunities to center learners in our innovations? Uh, I think each of you may have something to say about that, but, but Ari, I was wondering if you could go first because uh, you're, you know, each of you represents a different swath of higher ed and with a community college area, which is so, so learner centric. I'd love to hear your thoughts. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think, um, you know, we, uh, a lot of really the entire, um, you know, learner success um, team is really built around that. So, um, you know, any student who applies to Calbright, um, you know, can enroll. And, um, you know, and so what we're looking to do is to provide whatever supports people need in order to be successful in the program. Um, so, um, you know, the a core, um, you know, component of the team, one, one is uh, on the instructional side, but another is on the, um, uh, the uh, academic success counselors and, and that whole team. And I would say that's very much, um, you know, student centric, I think, uh, or, in, you know, designed to support the needs of students. Um, and, um, I'll, I'll stop there. Well, that's good. I mean, that, that, if I may, Matt, that seems to echo some of your earlier concerns about taking innovation, expanding it out in a concentric circle, and connecting with other people on campus. In this case, student success, for example, is uh, is, is very important. D did you want to say more to that, Matthew? I would add that you know our team is learning innovation for a reason. We used to be the center for instructional technology, mm -hmm. and I think you know shifting the mindset from instructional top-down, you know, center-driven to learning, at which is the needs of our students and where they are and what we can do to support learning. I think that's an important move. It's not just a semantic one. It's a strategic one that I think is valuable and supported by, I think, what we know from cognitive science, that there are things that we can do for our students that will enhance their learning totally separate from what happens in the classroom. Um, some of the peer-to-peer -peer models are examples of that. Um, so I think that, that's been a move that we've made. But the other thing I would say is have the learner in mind whenever you design something and help your faculty do that as well. And I, I think a big role of offices like ours is to kind of be a broker between the supply side, which is our faculty expertise, and the demand side, which is our students, and including students who don't even exist yet, who haven't shown up yet, because if we're designing new programs, they're not yet there, they don't have a voice. And I think being a kind of broker in between so that we create programs where there is both supply and demand, that is a very valuable role for us to play 
in our institutions to make sure your program is successful, that there, there's a genuine need for it, that it's where the skills market is headed, where industry is headed, what people want to learn, and also that your faculty have the ability to do something that's differentiated and compelling and true to their expertise and um, you know, an expression of what your institution does and what their disciplines can do. So that, that I think is one way of how I think of this. It's not learners versus teachers, it's kind of bringing them together to create programs where you have both of those in tandem. Matthew, after the program, I'd love to catch up with you on that question about students who aren't here yet. Um, that's, that's a very, very important topic and it's a subtle one. I'd love to follow up with you on that. Um, but I am conscious of the fact that we have two minutes left and we have a doozy of a question uh, that came in from uh, Arizona State University. I wanna make sure that you guys get a chance to take a look at this because this might be a great way to wrap things up. Uh, this is from Wayne, who's the uh, Senior Director of Strategic Design there. Uh, and Wayne asks, should real innovation in higher ed lead to an academic business model? How should we define that model? Can it just be the bottom line, adoption, learner success? Okay, I'm thinking hard about this now. I'm thinking, oh, uh, we're out of time. We got to go. No, uh, what, what do you, I'll, I'll put that back up on the screen again. So it's a, it's a, it's a good question. Uh, should this innovation lead to an academic business model? You know, it's interesting um, because I was going to respond to the previous question and talk about how in the CSU context, but I'm sure other institutions have similar goals where we um, are all operating under a graduation initiative. It's called the GI 2025, um, focused on improving four and six year graduation rates. And I think having that unifying mission has ushered in an era of innovation and collaboration across business units, across um, disciplines. And, and I think it points to one potential, you know, metric in an academic business model is certainly graduates. Um, and I think, having that kind of unifying goal um, has enabled a lot of collaboration that's really key to that success because there's so many of the wicked problems require cross-functional teams to address and so many of the opportunity areas uh, you know so i'm thinking of technology spaces like um, smart campus esports the minute you start to dig into any of those they require cross institutional co cooperation for those to be successful so i think wayne raises a really tricky question at the end of the session you know so that's uh, but i but i do think it uh, that one of the metrics that we can look to is our graduates and our economic impact um, as as kind of a way to define some of those things and that's so so different for each of your institutions. Uh, I mean, you know, Ari is looking at a certificate-based program. Um, you know, um, uh, Matthew and Mike are both at uh, research universities where they have the undergrad degree, but also graduate programs on top of that. Um, and I know Kate in California, the graduation rate in the CSU system is such an important issue for the state government. Um, but friends, we are we have just blasted past the end of the hour, and I, I can't keep you any longer. Um, and I, I I'm so grateful to all four of you for these fantastic fantastic thoughts. Um, this is you, you four are a panel that I need to bring back um, down the road, especially as you learn as you develop and harvest your learning. Can I just quickly ask each of you? I'm just going to call on you to to ask what's the best way to keep up with you. Um, so let me ask first, Kate, what's the best way for people to keep up with your work there at CSU System? Uh, I think on Twitter, I'm on Twitter, and um, that would be the best place. I'll put my handle in the chat. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and uh, Ari, how about you? Um, I think I, I'll, I'll do the same. I haven't been active in a while, but uh, I might jump back in. Okay. Well, we, we'd all, uh, given, given the brilliance you've been showing today, we'd all appreciate that. Thank you. And uh, Matthew, how about yourself? I, I put my Twitter handle on the chat as well, and that is the best way to connect. Very good, very good. And last but definitely not least, um, Michael Goodward, how do we how do we stalk you most effectively? I'm, I'm going to follow the trend. I put my Twitter handle in the chat, and uh, I, I want to confess that I have my head has been down in 2020, so I sure. uh, look forward to sharing out more in 2021. And uh, convenings like this and maybe even in person later this year. Uh, Mike, I have a, I have a Twitter-based project coming up. Uh, so if you're interested, let me know. 
um, specifically okay. in 2020. Um, and uh, thank you, thank you. Um, and my thanks to all of you, uh, all of you in the Future Transform community for fantastic questions, great commentary, great thoughts throughout. Um, my hat's off to you. This was a really, really terrific conversation. But don't go yet. I just need to let you know what's happening in the near future for the forum. Uh, so just to remind you, we have uh, coming up a whole series of great programs for the next two months. If you'd like to learn more about them or to sign up, just go to tinyurl.com slash forum 2021. If you'd like to go keep this conversation going, talking about the social nature of innovation or how to sell it or what happens to lonely early adopters or more, we have all kinds of social media dimensions going on right now. And if you'd like to go back into the past, if you'd like to see what we've talked about so far, the mysterious Roland Moe who we discussed, other forms of innovation, just go to tinyurl.com slash FTF archive and you can see 236 videos of what we've been talking about previously. And in the meantime, if you'd like to learn more about the forum, just go to ftte.us. If you want to learn more about this technology, go to shindig.com. And in the meantime, uh, January 2021 is a pretty chaotic and dangerous time. I hope all of you stay safe uh, and do well uh, as we get through this. Uh, I'm really glad that we can all get through it together. Take care. I'll see you online. Bye-bye.